Hi my darlings, I'm Sophie Darlings and today is the day where we finally watched mostly complete lore of Hollow Knight by Mossbag. I'm so excited, I've been wanting to watch this for ages. Everyone's been telling me I wasn't allowed to watch it so I got all three endings and I found other stuff and did the DLC and now today is the day I finally get to do my rite of passage which comes with uh, doing a let's play of Hollow Knight which is watching this lore video and I'm so excited because I'm hoping this will clear up or confirm some of my suspicions so I'm not going to keep you guys waiting uh, much longer we're going to get straight into it and I'm so excited Woo! Contains a few spoilers. Oh boy. I've also never done a React video, so I don't know how well this is going to go. If you were to ask me, so, what is your favorite be. video game ever made? I would have to say Cory in the House for the Nintendo DS. <laughs> but Hollow Knight would be a close second. Hollow yeah, Knight well, was Corey released on was February 24th, 2017 by Team Cherry, an indie game studio based in the mythical also, land well. of Adelaide, South Australia. Over the past three years, Hollow Knight has become an indie darling. The game has sold over three and a half million copies. It was the opening game at ADGQ 2019. There's a Hollow Knight book, a line of plushies, t-shirts, nicotine patches, nuclear warheads, <laughs> and even vinyl I mean, records for all you goddamn hipsters. Team Cherry had one goal when making Hollow Knight. They wanted to create a world that allowed players to get completely lost in exploration. We can see this desire in Hollow Knight's design. The levels in Hollow Knight are massive, with secrets and rewards hidden in every nook and cranny. Be that powerful charms, special abilities, or uh... The game's navigation hey. system requires the player to work for their map, forcing them to make a stronger mental image of the world in their head. Christopher Larkin's score and Ari Gibson's artwork lend to this as well, creating an atmosphere that the player won't want to leave. But there's one aspect of Hollow Knight that keeps people like me coming back. The world building. I'm going to turn the subtitles off because I've just realized the subtitles there and it kind of ruins it. When Super Metroid launched in 1994, it stood out for its amazing sense of immersion. Now in 1994, I was busy not being alive, but I've watched enough- I feel like he just called me old in like so many different ways. That was so shady. <laughs> I feel like I've just been called old because I was born in 94. Uh, yeah. Oops. Oops. Oh dear. YouTube video essays to know that this game was a big deal. In case you didn't know, Super Metroid is basically the granddaddy of all Metroidvanias. That's why they're called Metroidvanias. Now in Super Metroid, there are moments that give the player a sense of depth. Basically the feeling that this world exists outside of Samus's interactions with it. In the room right before that diabetic crocodile thing, Samus can find the corpse of a diabetic random soldier. Crocodile. His inclusion here doesn't change the gameplay at all, but instead gives the player a sense of wonder about the world they are exploring. Who was this guy? Why was he here in the first place? Did he like jazz? Now, finding dead bodies like and jazz? other random garbage is pretty cool, right? Well, Hollow Knight basically does the same thing about no! a dozen times. <laughs> to the nail smith if you actually like beat him oh that's horrendous i hate that no absolutely not through its world building hollow knight turns hallonest into a living kingdom you can sense the ancient history of the land when you look at dilapidated structures or giant barred doors nothing feels like it was put into the game randomly there's a reason for it all except those reasons aren't the easiest to uncover hollow knight's Grab narrative is buried under layers of npc dialogue item descriptions, lore tablets, and even additional content like the Quarrel comic and Fan Gamer's Wanderer's Journal. These oh, past three wait, years what? have There's seen an comic? insane amount of research by the Hollow Knight community to make sense of Team Cherry's oh, wow. sprawling world. We've even made it to the point where people are looking at the in-game signs to try and decipher Hollow Knight's logographic language. In this video, I hope to give you a long and community's dedicated damn like i thought you know like i've played the souls games and the elden ring 
community and the lore depth that went into when Elden Ring came out was just absolutely insane. But the fact that there's members of the Hollow Knight community that are genuinely trying to decipher the language is whoa that's mind-blowing i i could never i'm not smart enough for that (laughs) like i love the world building i love like coming up with theories and trying to decipher it for myself but oh that's a that's a whole new level of in in you know a whole level of immersion holy moly and detailed look into the world of hollow knight exploring hellness history and uncertain future when I'm not busy making surprisingly accurate Super Smash Bros. roster speculation videos, or insightful podcasts about beloved subjects like the Donkey Kong Country television series, or whatever this was supposed to be, <laughs> I'm usually making videos about Hollow Knight. He's so mean. And while I am a seasoned Hollow Knight lore expert, I cannot confirm that every musing or theory Jeez. presented in this video is completely correct. I highly recommend checking out the lore section of the Hollow Knight wiki if you want a more neutral explanation Wiki. of Hollow Knight's Wiki. lore. But if you're too lazy to read, that? then I suggest Wiki. you sit back, order some Domino's pizza, or just grab a block of cheese from the fridge and enjoy the mostly complete lore I can't of Hollow have cheese. Knight. I'm lactose intolerant. It's a simple fact of life that every human worships a god, be that technology, ideologies, or in rare cases, god. As it god. turns out, the bugs in Hal Nest pretty much operate in the same way. From the mosskin born from the dream of a giant slug, to the emo kids of the ancient civilization who literally worship the darkness, there is no shortage of things to worship in the world of Hollow Knight. Our story begins with a creature very much worthy of worship. A creature born from the carcass of a worm. The carcass can still be found in the Kingdom's Edge, and it's our only good look at what worms actually looked like. At the time Hollow Knight occurs, it is suggested there are no worms left in the world. They were incredibly long creatures that featured little to no limbs. Another more mysterious property of worms was that they had some kind of perscience or foresight. Is that why the king's called the white worm then? Because if this is, if, if he's probably going to explain it and I'm cutting him off before he does. But if he's alluding to the king who was um, worshipped and idolized, as being born of the worm then that would make sense as to why he was because there is references to the white worm and i don't know if that's the worm in kingdom's edge or if that's just another title that they give to the king basically they could see the future to some capacity it isn't clear how effective this ability was considering how the entire race went extinct this foresight ability must have been pretty shit (laughs) <laughs> Getting back to this particular worm carcass, it is explained that this worm traveled across the distant mountains and wastelands beyond Hallownest. Once it arrived in Hallownest, the worm died. <laughs> Except not really. <laughs> Inside right. the maw of the carcass sits a pale broken egg, out of which hatched a new form of worm, a being of meager shell. This form the of the worm is usually referred to as the Pale King, and he's the character basically responsible for everything that happens in Hollow Knight. The Pale King is a higher being, a type of creature that exists above all others. His body was said to shine with a radiant vestige that harmed those who looked upon him. The ultimate goal of the Pale King seemed to be in line with that of other worms. A line from the cryptic Mr. Mushroom reads, Worms pull bugs into their thrall, till ages pass and kingdoms fall. In other words, it's just in their nature. Dogs wag their tails, cats bury their shit, and worms bring massive amounts of bugs into their service in order to form long-standing kingdoms and civilizations. And here in a far corner of the world, the Pale King emerged from the corpse of his former self and began to build his eternal kingdom, Hallownest. There's this one slight problem. There's like people already living there. The area that would eventually become Hallownest was already filled with mantises, bees, moths, spiders, mushrooms, and bush cosplayers. <laughs> Each of these meme. groups were already operating with their own cultures and societies. And- so essentially, it's kind of... I, I'm Probably people are going to get sick of me because I keep bringing Elden Ring into this, but it, it's similar in terms of the fact that Elden Ring was already a land occupied by many gods when Marika the Golden was essentially established, and it was through her will and her desire that essentially all the other gods were kind of phased out and they kind of occupied that um they kind of occupied 
the area. So I'm wondering then if that's kind of what it works as, is that they've attempted to try and occupy parts of um, Hallow Nest that is already occupied by other tribes or kingdoms or rival factions so sort of similar to how the mantises are so volatile to anybody that comes into that area is because maybe that's maybe they've there's been attempts to occupy and to erase them or to get them to submit to the will of the king but they refuse to do so because they don't acknowledge the king because they have their own lords which is the mantis lords so maybe that's why they're so volatile and they're so angry all the time all the time because they're like hold up a second we keep getting invaded we don't want this but it would also make sense as to why it's like a warrior tribe and each group had a different interaction with the pale king one of the more receptive groups to the arrival of the Pale King were the mushrooms of the fungal wastes. Yeah, These creatures crap, were able why. to communicate with one another through one shared mind. The what? mushrooms viewed the shared mind. mind as a strength, and they were kind of smug dickheads about it. Ultimately, <laughs> the mushrooms wearily accepted the Pale King's rule, viewing his foresight as a shield to the dangers of the future. Another group living in the fungal wastes is the Mantis tribe. The Mantises have a rich cultural history reaching back to long before the birth of Hallownest. The Mantises are a proud tribe, believing in the importance of proving one's physical strength. The Mantises are fiercely territorial, but will show respect to those who display great power. These Fight Club enthusiasts were led by four powerful Mantis Lords, who I guess just kind of sat around waiting for outsiders to challenge them. The Mantis tribe had no interest in the Pale King's kingdom. But the two communities did come to a truce. In exchange okay. for their independence from Hallow Nest, the Mantis tribe kept the beasts of Deep Nest from invading Hallow Nest. Not sure why oh, they didn't. Oh, that's why there's the door and it's blocked off. That makes so much more sense now. I was wondering because there's, that door is locked until you defeat the Mantis Lords and they kind of don't let you go in that way. That makes so much sense. And just go out the other exits from Deep Nest, but whatever. I'm not an expert on Border Patrol. We'll not talk about I don't that. work at ICE anymore. <laughs> Let's move on to Deep Nest. Now many of the different tribes of Hallow Nest were kind enough to leave lore tablets behind, detailing pretty much everything we need to know about them. Unfortunately, the bugs of Deep Nest didn't do that. We know that the spiders of Deep Nest had a monarchy because why not? Those are always good, right? Also within Deep Nest are a separate group of spiders that immigrated to Deep Nest at some point in the past. This group was known as the Weavers, and they established their own culture and history within Deep Nest. They used looms of silk to weave stories, spells, and shields. One thing we know for sure about Deep Nest is that they really didn't want anything to do with Hallow Nest. The struggles of Deep Nest Hallow Nest relations would become painfully clear as time goes on, but for right now, it seems like the two remained fairly isolated from one another. Another section of pre Hallow Nest includes Green Path. Now as far as we can tell, the mushrooms, mantises, and spiders of Deep Nest didn't worship any higher beings. There is but there was a higher being worshipped in Green Path, which was the shape of Un. Or one, the shape of Un is the charm, but Un is pretty much mentioned throughout the entirety of Green Path. Every time you come across something, it's in reference to Un, and it's always in such like... It's it's always like this figure is revered and respected and well loved, but you don't really see any mention of the king anywhere in Green Path. So that's that's a curious indication that potentially Green Path was resistant because they had their own path to worship. But then again, it could be that maybe they strayed away from Un and moved towards the king, which meant Un ends up forgotten in that little lake where you find him and he's all sad well i don't know if he's sad he just kind of looks sad he needs a cuddle there's this giant mushroom corpse in the fungal core but i don't think this is a higher being i mean who the hell would want to worship a fat ass mushroom fat ass slugs me now that's dope the land we know as green path was created by the higher being known as un un used her great mind to dream the vegetation of green path into the once barren caverns Un's followers, the Mosskin, were also born out of Un's dream, making her their creator. Green Path at its height was actually much larger than we see in game. At one point, Green Path stretched into both modern day Queen's Garden and possibly Fog Canyon. Green Path's citizens showed themselves to be a fairly developed society. They built a temple at the Lake of Un in order to worship her, and they even had their own line of defense, with Moss Knights showing oh, proficiency yeah. in combat. 
using nails and shells as weapons. The law of Un continued to remain in effect even after the Pale King arrived, but it seems like they allowed the king to establish a road through their lands, leading travelers to the heart of Halonest. Hence the name Green Path. Yeah, Team Cherry really racked their brains when naming this area, didn't they? <laughs> Next, we have the bees. And the while there is no lore on how these bees can turn into fucking drills, or how they can ignore all known laws of aviation, we do know how they reacted to the Pale King. These bugs decided to seal their hive off Basically from the rest of the world, <laughs> with only patrol bees being able to enter and exit the hive. So yeah, the bees are pretty much pointless in this story. And finally we have the moth tribe. Not the bees! In game, the only moth settlement is in the resting grounds. But the tribe might have also inhabited the Crystal Peak at one point. Now as we all know, moths in real life are just complete assholes. As for the moths in Hollow Knight, well, it's a are bit they? complicated. The moth race is described as being a rather pacifist group, with few ever choosing to take up a weapon. During the Pale King's reign, the moth race delved amongst dreams and the dead displaying the importance of remembering those who have passed, as well as learning how to shape dreams themselves. Similar to the Mothkin, the Moth tribe was born from a higher being known as the Radiance. The Radiance is described as being a light in which the Moth tribe basked. So she was basically a giant lamp to them. Another important aspect about the Radiance <laughs> is her ties to dreams and a substance known as Essence. Essence are the remains of wishes and dreams, and are represented in-game by these dream catcher particle effects. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Give me a second. What if Radiance was there for us? What if Radiance was the beginning? Like, Radiance and the Moths were what existed before Hallowness became a thing. And that as a consequence of the Pale Worm, aka the king, they were kind of forced out or eradicated and people forgot that the Radiance existed. What if then the infection is almost a curse upon the king's reign because of what he has done to Radiance and her people? Sort of, you know, punishing the colonizer in a way. I don't know. Hmm? We'll get into it. I'm sure he's going to get into it, but I don't know. The thought just came to my mind there when he was going on about um the moths being sort of pacifists and radiance um you know dream essence and wishes like what if the stream essence and wishes that we find throughout are sort of the remnants of worship to radiance because radiance was what came before essence can take the form of whispering roots as well as dream ghosts both of which are memories taking root in the world the radiance appears to be a creature made of essence but she isn't the only higher being to give off essence Un has green particles, the Pale King has grey particles, and this sexy character named Grim gives off fiery red particles. However, the Radiance appears to be the main god when it comes to dreams, even if other gods also dabble in the dream realm. Getting back to the Moth Tribe, it is their interaction with the Pale King that we need to discuss. Basically the Moths turn their backs on the Radiance completely in order to worship the new light that had appeared, the Pale King's light. Lamp. So yeah, moths are assholes in this game too. Wow. With her tribe forsaking her, the Radiance became a forgotten memory, a oh, remnant so of the past, sad. and a thing that's definitely not going to come up again later in this video. And so the Pale King's new kingdom was established, Hallownest. But there is one aspect of Hallownest that we need to discuss. Unfortunately, to better understand this, we're going to have to read some poetry. In wilds beyond they speak your name with reverence and regret. For none could tame our savage souls, yet you the challenge met. Under palest watch you taught, we changed. Base instincts were redeemed. A world you gave to bug and beast as they had never dreamed. This is from a poem titled Elegy for Hallownest, written by Motomon the Teacher. The poem appears at the beginning of every playthrough, and hints at what the Pale King and his kingdom offered. Much of the land outside of Hallownest appears to be a wasteland, where bugs survive off of instinct, without the burden of mind. Hallownest somehow taught these bugs and tamed their savagery. Basically, the Pale King changed the instincts of his subjects and granted them higher thought. To get a better picture of this, let's look at two different characters, Boone and Tuck. These adorable panda bug things give us a clear display of Hallownest's effect. While both appear to be the same species of bug, Boone is dumb as a sack of rocks, 
struggling Aww. to string together words, while Tuck speaks fairly clearly. The main difference between these two characters is that while Boone lives outside of Hallownest, Tuck lives beneath the city's capital. Basically, it appears as though Hallownest is a literal holy ground that raises the intelligence of those who dwell within. The Pale King established a path, starting from the kingdom's entrance in King's Pass, winding through Greenpath and the Fungal Wastes, and finally ending at the massive capital at Hallownest's heart. We Which is why you're warned before you go in to obey and listen to the King's Law before you just step inside, because essentially that is you're entering their territory now. So yeah, that would make sense as that because we existed outside, but what has me the most curious is how did we get outside Hallowness if we're in the abyss? That's what I, I don't quite understand is how we ended up where we ended up when the abyss is at the bottom of Hallownest. We now know the capital city as the City of Tears, but that was likely not its original name. The rain that falls down onto the city from the blue lake above didn't begin until after the kingdom collapsed. So unless the capital was originally named by some edgy literature student, the name City of Tears wouldn't have made much sense. The king's wow, motivation for all this appears to have been his desire to be worshipped. The citizens of Hallownest believe that the Pale King created the world and everything in it. Shrines to the king can be found scattered throughout the kingdom, and king's idols were created and distributed to followers of the king. Despite the worship, the Pale King often kept himself hidden from his subjects, possibly to hide his blemishes. I mean, if you look at the size of the real Pale King to his statue in the ancient basin, the man is clearly overcompensating. The God Pale complex. King's White Palace was also built underneath the city, separating him from his subjects even more so. At the same time, Certain powers became shunned in Hallownest, though we don't know for sure if the Pale King had anything to do with this. Lifeblood is a blue liquidy substance that leaves those who drink it feeling refreshed. However, the use of lifeblood was seen as a taboo, and those who used it were demonized as heretics. The use of soul for combat was also shunned. Soul is a sort of life force in Hollow Knight that animates the bodies of living creatures. But some characters are able to control the soul of others to conjure powerful spirits. But aside from a few exceptions, no citizens of Hallownest ever used this power. However, the Pale King didn't rule alone. There was another higher being in the mix, a being known as the White Lady. The White Lady is a weird root-like being that can be found in the modern day Queen's Gardens. She is encased in a strange cocoon and we know very little about her. With as much exposition we get for the Pale King, there is next to nothing on the White Lady. But one thing we do know is that she likes to breed. Like, a lot. Yeah. The White Lady would often retreat to the Queen's Gardens, an area of land once controlled by the Moss That's why King. she's confined How herself. How exactly she walked around and actually went places is a lore question too deep for even my expertise. Well, no, because she pretty much tells you that she confines herself because of her base urge to breed. Like, she does say that, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> that doesn't mean that she was always in the shape or form, and like we know that creatures can change their shape or form, so there's nothing to dispute the fact that she also couldn't change shape or form, and that what we see her in is her way of confining herself to this cocoon because she has participated in breeding um into into helping breed these children with the king in order to be used for the greater good of Hallowness and has come to you know regret her decision and has confined and locked herself away to prevent that baser animalistic urge that she has that compels her to keep producing offspring so yeah i mean th there's no <laughs> there's no evidence to suggest how she got around but there's nothing to dispute the fact that this may not have been her original form before we find her the white lady is also known as a pale being along with the pale king what exactly are pale beings well we don't know for sure but they seem to stand out even amongst higher beings as being even more powerful. I know that's a little confusing, so let's try using an example. I'd say that regular higher beings are like a TP-Link Archer C7 AC1750 wireless dual band gigabit router, 
while Pale Beings are like the Asus RT-AX88U AX6000 dual band okay. 8x <laughs> gigabit Wi-Fi router. Under the Pale King, Hal Nest underwent a bit of an industrial revolution. He ordered the construction of the Stagways, which boy? were used to transport passengers and goods. The Forgotten Crossroads and the storerooms above the City of Tears were used to store goods that traveled along these Stagways. The king also ordered the construction of the tramways, because literally no one is safe from the threat of automation. A tram was built between the Forgotten Crossroads and the resting grounds. A second tram was built from the kingdom's edge, across the ancient basin, over to Deep Nest. And then a third tram was started in Deep Nest, and attempted to go further into Deep Nest. Not sure how useful that would have been to the bugs of Hallow Nest, but whatever. The Pale King's a smart guy, I'm not gonna question him. But anyway, the Pale King's super smart plan to build a tram in Deep Nest ended up getting a few of his tram workers killed. The bugs of Deep Nest rejected the Pale King's attempt to build a tram in their territory, further cementing the poor relations shared between the two groups. Aside from convenient fast travel, regular pathways were also used to cart goods around the kingdom. From this was born probably one of the most important groups in Hallow Nest, and perhaps even all of fiction. An elusive guild of bugs, simply known as the Mender Bugs, took to maintaining the various signs scattered throughout Hallownest. From the journal entry of one Mender Bug, we can Aww. catch a glimpse into their ancient and unknowable minds. Dear, dear diary, isn't life just the most beautiful thing? Fixing signs, mending posts, let them break I say. I'm a better mender for all that repairing. I sometimes doubt there's a single bug in all of Hollow Nest happier oh, than so me. Cute, Another example of the Pale King's expanding infrastructure is the Crystal Peak. This area is filled with crystals that grow rapidly along walls, ceilings, and even the shells of certain bugs. These crystals were considered valuable to the bugs of Hollow Nest, resulting in large-scale mining efforts. We don't actually see the crystals used anywhere else in Hollow Nest, but they are said to contain a sort of energy. The crystals are also said to sing, if you listen very carefully. In terms of I. military, Halloness's first line of defense appeared to be a group simply known as the Five Great Knights. The members of this esteemed coalition were Ogrim, Hegemol, Zamir. Oh, so that's his name, Hegemol? Okay, I, I don't know how we're supposed to know that or where we discover that, but yeah, unfortunately, never found out his name. Dryya and Isma. Oh, Dryya! For being so important, most of the information about name. these knights has been lost to time. Ogrim is the knight we know the most about, since oh, he is one I of the few him. knights still alive during the events of the game. Ogrim expressed a great amount of loyalty towards the Little king, and he maybe had something going on with Isma. But we really don't know. Hagemol was known for his sense of humor and his soft-spoken voice. But at the same time, he was also dummy thick. Mysterious Amir arrived in Halinus from a serene land, bringing with her a collection of delicate flowers. At some point, she also got into a relationship with a mantis. But not just any mantis. A daughter of one of the mantis lords. So yeah, it seems like these great knights were slaying in more ways than one. All we really know about Dryya is that she was fierce, caring, and wise. As for Isma, she was described as being kind. She also appears to be some sort of weird plant life form, but there's no information on where she's from or what her powers were. The Five Great Knights play an important role in the Champion's Call, the Knotted Grove, and the Battle of the Black Worm. We have no idea what these events were or how they affected Halonest, but they sound cool nonetheless. During Halonest's reign, there was another strange area that seemed to exist separate from the Pale King's rule. Carved out of the corpse of an ancient bug, an area called the Colosseum of Fools was constructed, and it was a destination for warriors from outside Halonest. The sole purpose for fighting in the Colosseum appeared to be simply for glory, with a mysterious figure known as the Lord Fool overseeing the combat. We don't know when the Colosseum was constructed, or if the Pale King was involved, but one of his servants, the Pale Lurker, became a Aww. champion in the Colosseum, Feels perhaps so indicating the Pale, the Pale King's approval. And finally, there was the Royal Waterways, where the fecal oh. excrement of the kingdom was washed out into the fungal wastes. Worst this place. area saw the rise of a species of parasite-like creatures called the Flukes. 
The flukes spawn from the fluke marm, a giant monster with cavities in which. 10 out of 10, the worst place. Like, it doesn't even compare to Deep Nest. Deep Nest is, is nothing. Is nothing compared to the royal royal waterways. If you, if that makes any sense at all, the royal waterways are so freaking disgusting. Deep Nest is okay. Deep Nest is fine. It's a bit scary. It's a bit spooky, but it's clean. The royal waterways, oh, disgusting, horrible place. Tinier flukes live. There really isn't too much lore involved with the flukes, but I do need to point out that the fluke them. marm is canonically a milf. Like, <laughs> that's not even debatable. No, the sky it's is not. blue. 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we all want to fuck this thing. No! No, we don't! No, we don't! No, we don't! Just because it has holes doesn't mean it's a goal! No! Oh, that's so disgusting. <laughs> I remember reading the lore aspect of uh, Fluke Mum when I, like, the, in the Hunter's Journal, and it was like, the goddess of fertility, and I was like, oh, <laughs> nope. Absolutely not. And so this was the kingdom of Halnest at its height. Halnest was a vast kingdom connected by a network of stagways and tram stations. The bugs of Halnest mourned their dead on the resting grounds, engaged in commerce using Geo, the de facto currency of the region, and a thriving capital located in the middle of the kingdom. Best the Pale song. King had succeeded in crafting a full-blown society, but we all know there are pitfalls to living in a oh, society. No. As a suspiciously knowledgeable hunter points out in his journal, the Pale King had created a population of weak and pathetic creatures. The bugs of Halnest did not hunt for their own food and had become complacent with their comfort. This is even more obvious with the east wing of the capital. These greedy members of Halnest's high society became complete cowards, obsessed with riches and plum from excess wealth. The bugs living in Halness Prime looked quite different than the instinctive simpletons they once were. Yeah, but that makes sense that the hunter would revoke the city and the city's occupants because essentially what the king has done when he's come in and has occupied and set up is that he has, yes, given them greater intelligence, but at the same time has encouraged them to turn away from their natural instincts and to behave in ways that are abnormal to their basic instincts. So of course the hunter's not going to agree with that because the hunter is about animalistic urge and, um, you know, he he very much is still a base, not a baser being. I don't know if that's like the right word to describe the hunter, but the hunter very much does rely on that animalistic side of himself because he constantly talks about eating bugs and preying on bugs and hunting bugs. So... It would make sense as to why like he has such a disregard for like creatures that have turned their back on the way that they used to be for luxury and softness and coziness when the world that they live in is still not this peaceful you know that when the world outside is still dangerous in a sense their savagery had been replaced with intelligence and through that intellect they gave the Pale King the devotion and service he desired. And while there were a few snags along the way, they were shining times for the King and his subjects. Resting at the threshold of Halonest is a strange lore tablet, proclaiming Halonest to be the last and only civilization. It calls Halonest an eternal kingdom. This appears to have been the Pale King's goal, for Halonest to stand against a wasted world as a final beacon for civilization. And that was the Pale King's ultimate folly, to think that he could succeed where so many others had failed before. Long before the Pale Kings or the Barry Bensons of the world, the land of Halinus was controlled by an ancient caste. Hints of Halinus history are littered throughout the land, with the most notable examples being the soul totems and arcane eggs. One sect of these ancient bugs didn't worship a god like the Pale King or any lord, but instead a dark and mysterious substance known as the Void. This ancient caste once also tried to lay claim to the entire land of Halonest, but they too failed. In his quest to conquer all of Halonest, the Pale King had made an enemy. An enemy long forgotten. An enemy that was about to be remembered. I mentioned earlier that the Moth tribe entirely forgot about the Radiance in order to worship the Pale King, but that isn't quite true. Memories of her still lingered, and hushed whispers of faith kept the Radiance alive. At the summit of the Crystal Peak, 
a location known as Halloness Crown, a strange collection of glyphs can be found. Joining these glyphs is a statue of the Radiance, presiding over the kingdom below. This old summit is the sole standing shrine left to the Radiance. This was built in order to keep the memory of the Radiance alive. The Radiance's light began to appear in the dreams of Halloness citizens. This light manifested itself in an infection that ravaged through the kingdom's tunnels. Those infected would fall into a deep sleep and awaken with broken minds. Some of the lesser bugs tried to resist the Radiance's light, which only resulted in them being consumed by it even more so. Many infected bugs lost their wills and began attacking bugs that weren't infected. The infection also twisted. Bug from Bugs Life, Jesus Christ. Um, that would make sense as to why some of the bugs have a deeper infection than others, and it's not mainly because it's a mutation, but maybe because they, you know, as Moss Bag said, uh, were more stronger willed and willing to actually resist. Twisted the bodies of its hosts, causing them to bloat and occasionally develop orange cysts on their bodies. For many victims, they were reverted back to their basic instincts carrying out the duties they once fulfilled in life, but now as mindless slaves. Those caught up in the infection were linked into the Radiance's hive mind, allowing her to control their bodies if needed. Oh, wow. As the infection spread across Halloness, I never many really groups thought of looked it to as solutions like to mind. fight off the Radiance's light. But that makes the sense. gates to the City of Tears were closed in an attempt to keep the infection from reaching the city. The stagways were also shut down at some point, and many of the stags eventually died out but some took more proactive oh efforts against the infection. The scholars of the Soul Sanctum decided to harness the power of Soul in an attempt to fight the infection. This resulted in the deaths of hundreds of bugs, whose souls were sucked out and injected into the bodies of the scholars. Their Jeez. goal was to achieve some kind of pure focus, which would somehow protect them from plagues of the mind. The scholars I was about to say, was it really though to protect the city? It was more, I feel, an act of self-preservation because Soul- Leader, the Soul Master. Yeah, Soul Tyrant essentially says like the king put a stop to it and that as a consequence, uh, not as a consequence, but like put a stop to it, but he will be immortal, blah, 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 blah. Something along those lines, so- I don't think it was anywhere near an act of protection, but most definitely was a form of self-preservation for Soul Master and everyone that sort of resided in Soul Sanctum. Was driven mad by the sheer power of Soul, and his entire sect failed to avoid infection. But hey, at least they took as many innocent people down with them as they could. The Mantis Yay. tribe, showing a stronger will than the common bug, were able to stave off the infection. However, one of the four Mantis Lords turned against his sisters. He and his followers took in the infection willingly, as it gave them more strength and courage. At so What's interesting is Traitor Lord has the orange eyes, which indicates that they, they have imbibed the infection, right? So his sisters didn't, but he did, which has then led to him being a traitor and being cast aside, and he ends up in Queen's Garden. But those little bugs as you can see on the screen their eyes are black they're not orange so are they infected or are they just obeying commands of their lord who is infected At some point during all this the traitor lord and his followers were exiled from the mantis village eventually taking up residence in the queen's gardens the traitor lord's daughter ended up dying at some point this is the same mantis that was in a relationship with zamir one of the five great knights but the Mantises rejected their union because of Zamir's outsideness. As a gamer, this type of prejudice is all too familiar, <laughs> and honestly, it makes me sick. With the Five Great Knights completely useless to fight against the infection, the Pale King devised his own scheme. A scheme involving a strange substance known as Void. As I mentioned earlier, the Pale King's White Palace was built in an area called the Ancient Basin. But his castle wasn't the only noteworthy thing down there. At the bottom of the ancient basin was the entrance to a pit known as the Abyss. Within the Abyss was a lake composed of void. The Pale King realized that this void could be given form, as evidenced by an imprint of such deep within the Abyss, possibly left there by the ancient civilization that predated Halonest. 
The Pale King devised a workshop in his palace, where he placed Void in armor shells imbued with soul, creating servants known as King's Molds and Wing Molds. These Void creatures were somehow imprinted with the desire of the Pale King, so that they would serve him. It isn't clear when the Pale King started making these creatures. There is evidence to imply that even common bugs were aware of King's Molds. But the point is, the Pale King turned to the Void in order to create another creature. One that he believed could contain the Radiance and her infection. He tried to create a pure vessel. The Radiance's infection needs its host to have a will and a mind in order to enslave it. A pure vessel would be a creature made of Void designed to lack those features. The Pale King believed that by harnessing the Void inside a pure vessel, he would be able to stop the infection and keep Halloness lasting eternal. But his method for creating this so-called pure vessel was incredibly cruel. This is where the White Lady and her King Kong-sized libido come into play. These two higher beings engaged in a union of some kind, resulting in the creation of several eggs that were dropped down into the abyss. There, the Void seeped into these eggs, corrupting the offspring of the Pale King and the White Lady. This act resulted in the creation of the vessels. The vessels are not technically considered to be alive. They are shells created from the Pale King and White Lady that have been filled with the Void. Within each vessel is a shade, a completely void being hidden behind the face of the vessel. Vessels are also non-gendered, I guess because they're dead or something? I'm not sure if that's how that works, but whatever. I'm not an expert on these kinds of things. I don't work at ICE anymore. Thousands of vessels were created so yeah, so that makes sense in regards to whenever we see any creatures sort of throughout, like when we meet the mask maker heading down to Deepness, he's a little bit perturbed by us. Um, and then there's routine comments made about our lack of nose, our lack of smell, and that we sort of lack the features that other bugs have. So that makes sense that we're not actually really a bug we're just a shell occupied sort of in a way you know how like the maggots occupy their false knight's armor kind of like that in a way but more in depth in terms of because the maggots obviously a bug and the false knight it's armor but in a sense that that is a shell and the void being or the void shadow is occupying it and that's what's driving it but like it doesn't actually have sort of any um any other features that make it bug like during this process but only one was chosen as the pure vessel this particular vessel chosen by the pale king was deemed the hollow knight and was taken away to the white palace but i want to take a bit of a closer look at this part of the story there are a number of questions and theories surrounding this moment that i really want to dig into the big question surrounding this moment is why was the hollow knight chosen over any other vessel one common theory is that the Pale King took these vessels back to the White Palace and evaluated them using his giant collection of buzz saws. This theory is probably the least likely explanation. Could you imagine? It kinda exists just to explain the buzz saws, which is quite the mystery I'll admit, but yeah. doesn't really mesh with the vessels very well. How does being good at Super Meat Boy prove that you are a worthy vessel? And while thinking about logistics in a game about You're magic bugs now. is never a good idea, how exactly did the Pale King transfer these thousands of vessels to his palace without characters like the Dung Defender finding out? So this means that the Pale King probably made his decision without taking any of the vessels out of the abyss. So how did the Pale King make his evaluation? I think the best explanation comes from a theory I originally heard from a user named Golden Flower Fan. Basically, the vessels were hatched down at the bottom of the abyss and the first one to make it to the top was chosen by the Pale King. In a memory of this event, we see vessels falling from above back down into the pit of the abyss. Perhaps- I, I think I said something similar, not so succinct as, oh, they fell from the top and it was based on whoever could make it out but that completely does make sense that it would be based sort of on a trial and tribulation i think my theory was is that they never left the abyss because that wouldn't make sense because this was all done so secretly and so out of the eyes and watch of everybody else 
you couldn't transport all of these creatures to the White Palace. It just wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense. But I think I did say something along the lines of um, that I think... What was it I said? I think it was, I thought that they kind of duked it out, you know, like modern day Sparta where they would like pit their kids against each other, you know, like survival of the fittest, survival of the strongest. I kind of was like, oh yeah, they'll duke it out and they'll pick out the strongest one and that's why there was so many dead. But it kind of just makes sense that they're kind of strewn all over. It's because they failed to make the climb. I think mine was a little bit more brutal where the king was like, yeah, duke it out and I'll pick the strongest. Perhaps these vessels weren't being cast down into the abyss but fell while trying to escape out of it. The lore tablet outside the abyss appears to support this theory. It reads, Our pure vessel has ascended. Beyond lies only the refuse and regret of its creation. We shall enter that place no longer. This tablet was likely written right after the Hollow Knight was chosen, considering that is when the entrance to the abyss was sealed off. The tablet proclaims that the pure vessel has ascended, or in other words, climbed out of the abyss. And while cut content should never be considered canon, I would just like to point out that an earlier version of this tablet, found in the game's code, was even more explicit about this. It read, From below, our pure vessel has ascended. But how does making it to the top of the abyss first prove that the Hollow Knight is somehow a perfectly hollow vessel? Well, I think this whole concept might just be a misconception. What if the Hollow Knight wasn't any different from the other vessels? All the vessels were made in the exact same way after all. The idea that the Hollow Knight was somehow more hollow than the other vessels comes from the fact that there were so many vessels created in the first place. If they only needed one, then why create so goddamn many? I mean, this is like Octomom on steroids. <laughs> well, these are bugs we're talking about, so it would make sense that multiple offspring would come from one egg and it might have been a precaution to produce multiple vessels in hopes that at least one would be able to successfully escape the abyss. Or just in case Now it another explanation work, could be backups. that the Pale King just yeeted other vessels that made it to the top first after determining that they weren't hollow, which would better explain why so many were created. Ultimately, the exact details aren't super important, but I do find it interesting how many different interpretations can be pulled from this part of the lore. After the Hollow Knight was chosen, the Pale King sealed the doorway to the Abyss, leaving the discarded vessels to rot away in darkness. These actions were not taken lightly by the Pale King or the White Lady. Both participants expressed shame in what they did, but saw no other option to save the kingdom. But the vessels weren't the only poor sap sealed away in the Abyss. There's also a lighthouse that was built on top of a naturally formed spire, its light shining down on an ocean of Abyss below. Inside was one of the Pale King's royal retainers, who was left in charge of keeping the lighthouse turned on. So this brave soul was willingly sealed in a dark and dangerous tomb for the rest of his life just so he could not pull a lever. Well, at least he was living with purpose. With the abyss sealed and the Hollow Knight chosen, the Pale King's oh, plan was job. beginning to come together. The Hollow Knight was raised and trained to prime form, causing it to grow several times its original size. We don't know exactly why this happened, but I guess the Hollow Knight is just a grower and not a shower. We know that the Hollow Knight was trained to use a nail, but why was this even necessary? One possible explanation is that the Hollow Knight needed to protect itself in case an intruder tried to kill it. You know, like the player. Or perhaps <laughs> this was important in Hi. the process of containing the radiance. Me. Unfortunately, the details of that are never fully explained. The Hollow Knight might have somehow focused the Radiance inside itself, but Team Cherry gives us no explanation of how that might have worked. But that still wasn't enough for the Pale King. Additional seals were needed in order to protect the Hollow Knight's physical body while the Radiance was trapped inside of it. To achieve this, the Pale King sought the help of three particular bugs, who would later be known as the Dreamers. Lurian the Watcher, Motomon the Teacher, and Hera the Beast. Lurian is definitely the most mysterious of the three dreamers. He lived in the Watcher Spire in the City of Tears. From there, Lurian watched over the city with his telescope. Lurian was a pretty big fan of the king, so it probably took little convincing for him to lie down for him. Lurian might also be tied to another strange incident that occurred in the City of Tears. Hidden on some of Lurian's lore tablets are images of jars, the same jars that can be found stockpiled in the Tower of Love. 
This building sits on the outskirts of the city and is the oh. setting of one of the most bizarre bosses in the game, the Collector. The Collector is a void construct that appears to have been made from the same mold used to create the King's molds. But the Collector is unique because, well, nah. Good grief, he's naked! The Collector stayed in the Tower of Love with a noble bug who likely owned the establishment. In the tower, a number of bugs can be found captured in jars, implying that these two were tasked Wait, with collecting these lover? creatures. However, the collector somehow became obsessed with grubs, creating oh, a map to keep track of grubs it captured in jars, in my head that they as well as keeping lovers. a strange shrine displaying a grub in the style of the Vitruvian Man. Eventually, the bug staying with the collector decided to lock it inside the Tower of Love and fled to the Queen's Gardens, where it died likely due to overexposure to the void. Despite being locked up in the tower, the Collector is still spotted by the Hunter at some point, which either means this only happened recently, or the Hunter has been farting around in Hallownest for a long ass time. <laughs> we have no idea what these creatures were trying to do. It's implied that the Collector was trying to preserve the creatures of Hallownest, perhaps trying to protect them from the spread of the infection, but we don't know where the Collector's obsession with grubs originated. Because and while Larian does seem connected to all of this, we don't know how involved he was with this operation, or what its end goal exactly was. But could, it be, could it be a form of collecting to us preservation in terms of like, oh, you know, if everything dies out because of the infection and that we kind of can't get a wrestle on, and we have to move on to another land. At least they have bugs that they can sort of bring back from the brink of extinction, maybe? I don't know, maybe that's why. The lived in the teacher's archives, a library built atop a lake of acid in the Fog Canyon. The lower half of her body consists of tentacles, making her a popular subject for the thriving Hollow Knight R34 community. Oh no. The archives and the Fog Canyon as a whole are also filled with these strange Metroid knockoffs. These creatures are likely related to Monomon in some way. They could be her live offspring, her test tube babies, or possibly even her shit. Monomon uses futuristic cathoid ray tube things to store information about Halonest. Several terminals in the teacher's archive go into detail about the Pale King's plan to defeat the Radiance, indicating that Monomon had intimate knowledge of what she was taking part in. Finally, the Pale King sought the help of Hera the Beast, the Queen of Deepnest. Now as I mentioned earlier, relations between Hallownest and Deepnest were kinda... not great. Unlike the other two dreamers, Hera needed to be convinced in order to help the Pale King. Hera would eventually agree to become a dreamer, in exchange for a child. The Pale King agreed and the two engaged in a dalliance, which is a fancy way of saying they totally boned. Oh, the White Lord. Lady was okay with this arrangement. In fact, she might have been watching from the closet. The motive behind Hera's request is never elaborated on, but it appears as though the King of Deepnest was dead at this point. Hera was a common bug, so perhaps she desired the Pale King's Pale Seed so that her child could be of high birth. The bargain between Hera and the Pale King resulted in the birth of Hornet. She became known as the gendered child because unlike the Pale King's other children, Hornet was not hollowed out by the Abyss. Hera and Hornet spent little time together, as Hera had to make good on her end of the bargain. And so the three dreamers were put to rest. Through their actions, a seal was placed over the Black Egg, prohibiting- It may not necessarily be because she wants Hornet to be of a higher being. It could necessarily be the fact that if she's agreeing with the king to be sealed away for the sake of um, protecting Hallowness, which includes Deepness, even though they're on bad terms, there is probably an understanding or fear that if the infection is allowed to run rampant, by extension, Deepness is eventually going to be impacted. So she's coming to make these terms, which means she's going to have to be put to rest. Then she's going to want somebody that's going to take over her throne. So maybe it's not necessarily about creating a child that is of a higher being or of a higher value, but n but more securing her claim and securing her throne and securing 
um deep nest under her terms it's it's not going to fall into the hands of anybody associated with the king it's it's her child even though it's the king's child as well but the king's child didn't raise her but it's it's a matter of securing essentially Hera's legacy for deep nest entrance into the chamber these dreamers also had their own protection at the base of Lurian's spire the watcher knights guarded access to their master's body Maudamon's body was protected by a giant jellyfish named Umu. On top of this, Maudamon entrusted her servant Quirrell with a mask which would be required to break an additional seal she had placed over herself. So she basically is double wrapping herself. As for Hera, we're not really sure what protected her, since it is never actually seen in game. We don't know where this creature is hiding, but whoever it is, they really suck at their job. Now there appears to be one more element to the Pale King's plan, involving the Weavers. Hidden away in the Weaver's Den is an incomplete seal of binding, woven from silk. This design prominently features the Hollow Knight's head, and can be found in the White Palace, as well as blocking the exit during the Hollow Knight fight. Silk spools created by the Weavers can be found in the Stag Station in Deep Nest, as well as the Stag Station next to the White Palace. These spools can also be found in the Pale King's workshop. We know that the Weavers were closely tied to Hera and Hornet, so their actions might have been a part of the deal between the Pale King and Hera. Once the Hollow Knight was ready, the Radiance was somehow channeled into the vessel, which was then placed inside of a giant black egg located in the Forgotten Crossroads. This egg was built to sustain the Hollow Knight, and itself appears to be fashioned from void. The Hollow Knight was chained up, and the entrance to the black egg was locked behind a powerful seal created by the Three Dreamers. Initially, this convoluted plan actually worked, and the infection was successfully contained. Memorials to the Hollow Knight and the Dreamers were erected in the City of Tears and the Resting Grounds. But this is the part of the story where things get a little bit hazy. By the time these statues were constructed, citizens had taken to writing on parchment woven from spider silk, which was all destroyed when water started pouring down onto the city. We don't know how long the Hollow Knight was able to completely contain the infection. Bugs from Dirtmouth used to go to the Temple of the Black Egg to pray, saying they felt at peace within the walls. But after a while, they stopped going, perhaps indicating that the infection was beginning to leak out again. The infectious air continued to seep through Hallness for years, eventually even reaching the deepest parts of the kingdom. As it turns out, the Pale King's pure vessel wasn't quite so pure after all. The Hollow Knight had been tarnished by an idea instilled. While the game never explicitly tells us what that idea was, it does hint strongly at what it might be. Hidden away in the White Palace is a memory showing the Hollow Knight and the Pale King sharing a moment. The Hollow Knight might have developed a parental bond to the Pale King. And who could blame it? The Pale King is a pretty great dad after all. You know, if you ignore the infanticide and everything. Remember those smug mushroom dickheads? Well, it turns out their trust in the Pale King was a complete mistake. That shared mine isn't looking too good now, is it? In the fungal core, the corpse of a giant mushroom lies dormant. Its final thoughts were, Pale Worm, what good to see a demise unavoidable. This could imply that the Pale King always knew that his kingdom was doomed. All he could do was delay the inevitable. This is likely the moment when Halinest, as it once was, entirely collapsed. The Hollow Knight had not completely stopped the infection, and while it may have taken a while, Halloness was eventually brought low. It's at this point that characters and areas begin to resemble as we know them in-game. When it became clear that the Hollow Knight was not able to contain the Radiance, the Pale King resorted to his final plan. He fucked off, hiding himself, his White Palace, <laughs> and his Pale Court in the Dream Bye. World. At this point, all of the furniture in the palace was covered under white sheets similar to how people in the real world cover their furniture while away on long trips. The palace was also completely covered with thorns and buzz saws, similar to how people in the real world cover their houses with thorns and buzz saws. Completely the Pale normal. King would eventually pass away while you sitting on his that? throne in the White Palace. There's no confirmation on what killed him, but there are a few things to consider. The throne room is incredibly dark compared to the rest of the palace and the particle effects Wait. and ambient track in this room are identical to that of the Abyss. All of the King's Molds surrounding the Pale King are dead. The ancient basin itself also has become stained You're with the presence leaking. of Void, 
as it can be seen as high Black as the rundown elevator armor. shaft leading back to the city. Remember so that bug that was sealed away vengeance. in the abyss to make sure the lighthouse wasn't turned off? Well, the lighthouse was turned off. I guess <laughs> the whole living with purpose thing is a crock of shit after all. It seems as though the sea of void itself actually convinced this bug to betray his king and turn off the lighthouse. To now I know what you're thinking. Exactly how thing. conscious is the void? Is the void able to think for itself? Can it form strategies? Does it host a podcast? Well, according to this Chozo statue ripoff, the void is powerful, but not unified. So while it can thrash around at things that come near it, or call out in unison to turn off a light, it's not a single conscious being. Getting back to the Pale King, one could argue that the Void might have played a role in his ultimate demise, and I've argued that viewpoint in the past, but we have to remember that there isn't enough evidence to know for sure. As an expert lawyer and a good friend of mine, Johnny Cochran once said, Any evidence that the Void was involved in the Pale King's death is circumstantial. My name is Johnny Cochran. Just above the White Palace, the bugs in the City of Tears weren't faring much better. Even if we ignore the fact that the infection was still around, there were other issues that helped lead to the city's downfall. Due to the gates being sealed, some bugs resorted to cannibalism in order to avoid starvation. And there's also that metric fuckton of corpses lining the walls of the Soul Sanctum. When all was said and done, the only citizen left standing is Eternal Emilita who just laughs her ass off about it like she's a fucking Dark Souls character. The White Lady ends she's up in a cocoon deep within life. the Queen's Gardens. She decided to place bindings on herself in order to keep her from spreading her seed. She claims that this is because of the shame she feels in helping the Pale King create the vessels, but honestly, it's probably just her kink. The White Lady also diminished her power, possibly as a way to keep herself hidden from unwanted visitors. Outside her cocoon, Drya stood guard, protecting her queen from the violent traitor mantises. Drya is eventually killed off by these bugs, which is actually pretty pathetic if you think about it. I mean, we're talking like the Netgear WPN824N N150 wireless router pathetic. Speaking of great knights, die. That's a bit harsh. Look, just a teeny tiny bit harsh in terms of the fact that like you don't know how long Dryer has been fighting them off for. Like it could have been years, years. And also you have to remember like bugs probably age. You know? It's a bit harsh to be like, oh, that's pathetic. Yes, she's a strong warrior, but warriors can get tired. They can get old. Maybe she's been injured. We, we don't know. We don't know. Let's not be mean to Dryer. She tried. Dying pathetically, let's move on to Hagemul. Hagemul held the city crest, a key used to open one of the gates to the City of Tears. At some point, Hagemul's armor shell was stolen by a maggot. Now, maggots were generally looked down upon and forced to do menial labor. They were incredibly weak, and basically deserved all of the discrimination they got. But this one maggot decided to turn the tide, so he stole Hagemul's shell so that he could that, defend though. his downtrodden brothers. His actions weren't motivated by the infection, but instead was the result of how hierarchical caste systems will always lead to revolution from the working class, <laughs> like, and that true freedom can mad. only be achieved, blah blah blah, capitalism is bad, revolution. subscribe to my Patreon. Ogre we moved to the revolution. Royal Waterways, and started living in shit, changing his name to Dung Defender. Now I love wallowing in shit as much as the next guy, but you'd have to really love shit to put up with living with the flukes. The Dung Defender kept an unwavering sense of duty and loyalty to the king, and love for his fellow knights. Aww. So much so that he made shit statues of them. How nice. As you do. Ogrim acted as the defender of the pipeways, as well as Isma's Grove. A section of the royal waterways became filled with acid, and in the middle of it all rests Isma's corpse, which has been overcome by plant life. Isma is likely the one responsible for this acid blight, but we have no idea what happened to her. Hornet's whereabouts during this time are fairly mysterious. We know that she departed Deep Nest and didn't return until the events of the game. At some point, she took to guarding Halness from intruding warriors, as well as the cast off shell in the Kingdom's Edge. Despite the Kingdom's woes at large, fortunately, this fate did not befall one of the fandom's favorite characters. The Menderbugs continued to fix the broken <laughs> signs and wayposts of Halonest. 
From a diary entry, we can see that one oh Menderbug in particular Lord. had found himself on the precipice of a long and loving relationship. Hello again, diary. Not long now until the next Minder bash. For a stealthy types, we're a riotous bunch when we it's get together. And Minderberry kept flashing me that smile. It might be time to muster my courage and act on it. I love my home and my life, but sharing it with another? Why, Aww. that'd be the berry on top. Whoa. Path also whoa, 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 some whoa, 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 Why did that Mender bug have mine camp? Hold up, go back. Excuse, excuse me. Hold up, I need to move this over slightly. Can I, can I move this over slightly? I can't, I can't, I'm not making this up, I promise. Hold up, hold up, hold up. It literally, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Why? Why does it have a, a mine a mine camp book? Do I do I want to question what's going on with the Mender bugs? Probably not. Why? That'd be the berry on top. Green Path also underwent some changes during this time. The Mosskin were waiting for Un's call, which would bring them back into the dream they were originally born from. But for some reason, Un's strength deteriorated. We don't know why this happened exactly. Was it due to the white lady claiming part of her kingdom? Was it somehow due to the infection? Some moths can believe that Un went into hiding, but it appears as though Un is, in fact, calling to her children. But many of the moths kin are unable to hear or call. Aww. Instead, many moths kin seem to have taken the Radiance's infection into their That's leaves, really which might explain why Greenpath became overgrown with vegetation despite Un's deteriorating powers. Mossy Vagabonds even openly chose to forsake Un and worship the Radiance. Another tribe to be screwed over by the Radiance is the Hive, which fell to the infection after the death of their leader, Hive Queen Vespa. But it appears as though this had little effect on their civilization. The Radiance's Hive mind was already familiar to the bees, since the Hive probably operated under something similar already. So in other words, the hive probably made out the best in this whole situation. Yeah, like let's the, turn our attention back to the moths. After all, it's their god that unimpacted. keeps killing everybody. Well, the moth tribe didn't fare too well, actually, as pretty much the entire tribe died out. The only known survivor is the seer. Despite the loss of her tribe, the seer continued to tend to the graves in the resting grounds, while also awaiting the arrival of the wielder, a mysterious being that her tribe has dreamt of for a while. In the Kingdom's Edge, the land the became covered in radiance? ash, molting off of the worm's decomposing corpse. The Colosseum of Fools continued to thrive. The Lord Fool passed away at some point, but nobody really seems to notice or even care. The fools inside the Colosseum were infected, but still seemed to have maintained control over themselves. It seems possible that these bugs took in the infection willingly, similar to the Traitor Lord and his followers. This would have given them an edge in combat, similar to using steroids, but without the whole shrinking testicles thing. However, even the traitor lord and his followers went mad, so what makes these fools any more special? As for the mm -hmm. Pale King's champion, the Pale Lurker, well, she just went the normal kind of insane. There appears to have been another unforeseen event with the Pale King's plan. When the Hollow Knight was originally chosen, the door to the abyss was sealed, trapping the discarded vessels within. But apparently, some vessels didn't get the memo. Vessel corpses can be found littered throughout the kingdom. Yeah, There's one in the ancient basin, me. one in Green Path, and the several trapped vessel. in Nosk's lair and deep nest. Another vessel that escaped from the abyss is the player Us. character, the Knight. The exact details on how the vessels escaped the abyss is unclear. There are indications that they might have slipped into deep nest through some old passageway, given void okay. influences in part of the area, and all the corpses found in Nosk's lair. At some point, all entrances to Hall Nest were closed off, with the old well and dirt mouth being the only way to sneak back in. Despite this, several people have wormed their way into the kingdom, with few ever returning. Characters like Relic Seeker Lem seem content to just pillage artifacts from the ruined kingdom, but other bugs seem interested in something greater. In the Howling Cliffs rests the corpse of a member of the Grim Troop. The task of this bug appears to have been to seek out Halonest, so that the troop might be summoned to the kingdom in the future. The Grim Troop are basically a group of bugs that serve a higher being known as the Nightmare Heart. The troop keeps the heart alive by feeding on the nightmares of fallen kingdoms. This process also involves sacrificing the troop master to his own child because... Uh... Hey look at this cool ass boss battle. 
Another important group that traveled to Hallownest are the God Seekers. After being abandoned by their old gods, the Gods of Thunder and the Gods of Rain, these bugs left their home in the Land of Storms, seeking out a new god to worship. The God Seekers looked to gods to save them from their own silent mind. While traveling through the wastelands, the God Seekers constructed devices called God Tuners, which helped them seek out new gods. Through this device, they were able to detect the lingering power of the Pale King and find their way to Hallownest. When they arrived, however, the God Seeker was forced into hibernation. She was encased in a strange sarcophagus-like cocoon, which was itself Why? chained up with a lock. It's not clear how this forced hibernation worked, seeing as the cocoon appears to have been made by the God Seeker herself. As for who put oh. the cocoon in chains, I think the most likely candidate is the Dung Defender, considering how the God Seeker's cocoon is found in the junk pit in the waterways, an area the Dung Defender has tasked himself with protecting. Mm -hmm. This was the general picture that of Hallownest after the Hollow Knight was sealed inside the Temple of the Black Egg. The kingdom was stuck in a kind of stasis, with the Pale King civilization destroyed and the Radiance unable to break free from her chains. The Pale King was rebelling against nature, trying to keep his work standing indefinitely. The stasis over Hallownest held for an age. How long is that exactly? Well, we have no idea. As I'm sure you've noticed, there really isn't a timeline for anything that happens in this game. We also have no idea how long any of these bugs can actually live. Elderbug wasn't around to see the stagways open, but we know several other characters were, implying that Elderbug is probably one of the youngest characters in the whole game. But this stasis over Hallownest wasn't going to last forever. At some point, the radiance erupted out of the Hollow Knight, cracking its shell. Could it be that he ages slower because he exists outside of Hallownest? Like, he doesn't live in Hallownest? So I wonder if maybe aging is different because maybe the infection kind of slows down aging. Hmm. And releasing a loud and powerful roar. The amount of infection leaking out of the Hollow Knight became even greater. The many corpses that lined the roads and cities of the kingdom sprang to life with the amplified power of the infection. This strengthened infection prompted the departure of the Weavers back to their old home. Now this old home might actually be Farloom, the kingdom in which Hollow Knight Silksong takes place. Oh. But the amount of knowledge we have about Silksong right now is pathetic, so I'm not saying that's confirmed or anything. This is I'm also so around the time sad. that Quirrell arrives back in Hallownest. His memory of Motomon appears to have been clouded due to his time outside of Hallownest. These events are depicted in the Quirrell prequel comic, which also shows an image of the Hollow Knight with a pre-cracked shell. This could mean that Quirrell's arrival happens roughly the same time the Hollow Knight's shell cracks. At around the same time Quirrell arrives in Hallownest, we also see the arrival of the player character, who is commonly referred to as the Knight. The Knight was one of the lucky vessels that was able to make its way out of the Abyss. Somehow, the Knight ended up venturing beyond Hallownest and into the wilds beyond. It's implied that the Knight was called to Hallownest by either the sealed Hollow Knight or the Radiance within. Hmm. Regardless, once the Knight shows up and yeets itself off this cliff, the actual game of Hollow Knight finally begins. Now, there's a lot of details we could get into. Hallownest is full of NPCs and bosses, whoa, whoa, each whoa. with their own- I have never seen that creature. Flute Kermit, I've never seen that before. ...own stories to tell. But to be honest, I don't think we need to go through all of them, since their stories are relatively straightforward. For example, let's look at the Brooding Moloch. So why is the Brooding Moloch brooding? Because all its it's friends lonely. are dead. And there you go. That's the lore for the Brooding Moloch. Also, it's the only character in the game with a visible asshole. Now, do you really need me to explain that to you? Probably yes. not. So instead, I'm just going to talk about the interactions relating to Hollow Knight's main story. The Knight is eventually noticed by Hornet, who lures it deep into Green Path. There, Hornet attempts to kill the Knight, claiming that she knows what it would try to do. At this point, Hornet views the Knight as being too weak. After the fight, Hornet can be found in the City of Tears, next to the statue of the Hollow Knight. Hornet mentions that the Knight has gained a resilience due to the time it spent in the void beyond Hallownest. This could be referring to the fact that some of those who leave Hallownest lose their memories, meaning the Knight would have no memories of its own tragic conception. Hornet tells the Knight that if it seeks to continue the stasis that keeps Hallownest standing, it must seek the Graven Ash, which is referring to the Kingdom's Edge. At this moment, Hornet sees the Knight as a possible replacement for the Hollow Knight. Basically, the Knight could break the seals that keep the Hollow Knight locked away, 
defeat the Hollow Knight, and contain the infection itself. It's at this point that I should mention that Hollow Knight actually has five different endings, because of course it would. I'm going to be explaining each of these endings in this video, as they each give us a different glimpse into the mechanics of Hollow Knight's world. Now to get the easiest ending to Hollow Knight, Hornet's instructions to go to the Kingdom's Edge can be ignored completely. If the knight stumbles I upon the resting grounds, the three ending dreamers will appear <laughs> and cast the knight into the dream realm. There, Seer will come to the knight's rescue and grant it the Dream Nail, a special blade that can tear the veil between the real world and the dream world. With the Dream Nail, the knight can venture to the resting places of the three dreamers, curb stomp their asses, and unlock the entrance to the Black Egg. Inside the egg, the knight finds the Hollow Knight chained up, silently watching over it. Once the chains are broken, the Hollow Knight screams with that familiar Radiance roar and pursues the knight. As the fight progresses, the Hollow Knight starts trying to kill itself, quarrel style. But then the Radiance starts using the Hollow Knight's body to perform her own attacks. Mm. Once defeated, the Hollow Knight begins to spew infection all over the place. The, the knight can then focus the infection into itself. This results in the Hollow first ending of the game, called Hollow Knight. In this ending, well, the knight usurps the Hollow Knight, prolonging the stasis well over Hallow Nest. New chains and bindings appear out of Fuck erased. If I Know and contain the knight, and a new seal is placed over the entrance to the Black Egg. Now there is one giant question looming over this egg. ending. Can the knight actually contain the infection indefinitely, or will no. the Radiant still manage to break free one day? Before we answer this question, let's look at some of the other events that can transpire while playing the uh, game. No. If the player chooses to go to Kingdom's Edge, Hornet will challenge the knight one last time as a final test I of think, strength. I think it would be inevitable After her defeat, that it would happen Hornet again. allows the knight to access the cast-off shell That's why where I don't the Pilk like the King ending. was originally like hatched. By interacting with this egg, Stop the knight's gap. shell is marked with the King's brand, technically making the knight the new ruler of Hallownest. With the King's Brand, the Knight can now open the entrance to the Abyss and discover the place of its birth. When leaving the Abyss, the Knight can encounter Hornet again, where for the first time, Hornet suggests that there are actually two outcomes the Knight can enact. She tells the Knight that it can either prolong Hallowness stasis or face the heart of the Kingdom's infection. Within the Knight, Hornet sees a chance for change. Instead of just replacing the Hollow Knight, Hornet believes that it may be possible to get rid of the infection completely by using the Void inside of the Knight. After visiting the Abyss and obtaining the Shade Cloak, the Knight is capable of reaching the White Lady, hidden away in the Queen's Gardens. The White Lady tells the Knight that she has been awaiting a vessel to accept a gift, that gift being one half of a charm called the King Soul, which she claims will give the Knight more power. The White Lady goes on to explain that she can feel the weakening of the Hollow Knight within her roots. She tells the Knight that it is free of the blemishes that made the Hollow Knight a flawed vessel. From this dialogue, it is implied that the knight truly is a pure vessel, capable of containing the Radiance successfully. But it's not quite that simple, so we're going to have mm. to dig a bit deeper into this. Basically, we're going to need to answer a simple question. What exactly does it mean to be a Hollow Knight? Despite the White Lady's words, we have a number of instances where the characters and item descriptions mention that the knight has a will, and maybe even a mind. But from the Pale King's dialogue when describing yeah, the Hollow Knight, it is stated choices. that a pure vessel has no mind or will. So is the White Lady wrong? Or maybe even lying? Her eyes have been clouded by time and she can be tricked into thinking that Ogrim is in the room when the Knight is wearing the Defender's Crest charm. She also thinks that Drya is still alive, which... uh... So maybe the White Lady is just senile. My problem with that theory is that the White Lady states that the vessels stand out to her clearly in a misted world, due to them being her spawn. She also questions whether or not the Knight sought her aid, which would imply that the Knight must have some kind of will. So for whatever reason the White Lady thinks the Knight is still capable of containing the, game, the Radiance, so have even if it's still able to make decisions. Element of After will. all, the Hall Knight was considered pure, but they still taught it how to wield a fucking sword. I mean, if the knight were truly and completely hollow in a literal sense, it probably shouldn't even be able to walk, or draw a yeah. map, or open a goddamn bank account. In short, this whole concept of being hollow is so abstract and hard to define, I don't really feel comfortable giving a solid answer on whether or not the knight is or isn't truly hollow, and I think the game leaves room open for other interpretations. 
Of course, the white ladies. What if the hollowness is just the the friends we make along the way? But in all seriousness, um, in terms of being hollow, I don't necessarily think it means not having a mind or a will. Or maybe it could be that's what the king has deluded himself into believing, is that these beings um, are mindless and have no will to break, that they're easily manipulated. Maybe that's a way of easing his own conscience when it comes to sort of destroying these vessels maybe maybe it's just a, a you know a way to ease his guilt and that's why he sort of maybe runs with the idea of hollow and pureness but in all reality they're not because they are yes they are <coughs> sorry yes they are shells that are made of void but at the same time they also spawn from two higher beings so they're essentially i i don't think that they can be without a sense of consciousness yes they're not quite bugs but i wouldn't go so far as to say that they have no will or mind or consciousness because depending how you play this game you make decisions for your night which are based on emotion and based on connection like saving creatures like um bretta if you were hollow and incapable of feeling you would just leave her like you you wouldn't go rescue her same with zoe you wouldn't rescue him you wouldn't feel that compulsion to do so so there must be some element of mind and comprehension of what is right and wrong depending on how you play this game which i guess is what leaves it up to interpretation as to how hollow is our little knight i don't actually think hollowness really plays a part in it i think it could just be a salve for the white king or to to ease oh the white king the pale king the pale king to ease his own guilt about the destruction of all these vessels um it's a way of being like we destroyed them because they weren't pure or hollow enough but in fact they have minds and wills of their own to some degree gift is useless without the other half of the king's soul in order to reach it, however, the knight must travel to the White Palace, locked inside the body of a king's mold. In order to bypass the seal, the knight must use a fully awakened dream nail. It can do this by bringing 1800 essence to the seer, allowing her to sharpen the weapon's blade. If the knight does this, the seer remarks that the knight truly is the wielder that her tribe has been dreaming of. There is no explicit reason why the moth tribe was dreaming about this supposed wielder so much, but it seems like they believe the wielder would wash away the crimes the moth tribe committed by turning their backs on the radiance. The seer yeah, seems so the to know infection. that the knight might kill the radiance, and she seems accepting of it, ready for her and her tribe to disappear and be forgotten forever. With the awoken dream nail in hand, the knight can travel to the Pale King's refuge and locate the other half of the King's Soul charm. When equipped, the King's Soul provides a never-ending supply of soul making it almost useful if it weren't for the insanely high cost of the charm <laughs> and the painfully slow rate at which it increases and the fact that the charm oh, wow. will get replaced in about five minutes after you get it. The King's Soul so Charm slow. itself symbolizes the union between two higher beings. To me, this implies that the King's Soul is a representation of a vessel, which also was created by the union of two higher beings. With the King's Soul in their inventory, the Knight now gains access to an area in the Abyss called the Birthplace. In this massive pile of vessel shells, the knight can find a giant egg. Dream nailing the egg allows the knight to access its own memory when it was cast down into the abyss. From viewing that memory, the King Soul charm is replaced with the Void Heart charm. The recollection of this event allows the knight to come to terms with the void inside itself. Once the knight has the Void Heart, the shades in the abyss no longer attack it, and that strange creature that gives the knight the shade cloak calls it the Lord of Shades. In other words, the knight has now bound the once fragmented void under its own will, allowing it to control the void in a powerful new way. Oh. With the union of the void, the pale king, and the white lady, the knight has gained a strength before unseen. It is with this charm that two additional endings become unlocked. Hornet will now be standing outside of the black egg, offering to help the knight should the opportunity arrive. Midway through the fight with the hollow knight, Hornet rushes into battle, subduing the hollow knight and piercing its shell. 
It's at this point that the knight is given the perfect opportunity to enter into the mind of its sibling, fighting the source of the infection head on, and finally putting an end to the Radiance's tyranny. <laughs> or I can just stand there and let Hornet get knocked unconscious. If the knight finishes off the Hall Knight as usual, the sealed sibling ending occurs. Basically, it's the same as the Hollow Knight ending, but now Hornet is in the room too, and her face yeah. appears on the door of the Black Egg. It's not clear what exactly this means for Hallownest. This might imply that Hornet is now a dreamer, but she's inside the temple, meaning that no one can actually get in there to kill her should the knight ever start leaking infection. At the same time, Hornet mentions that the bindings of the Black Egg would drain her, so she's probably just going to die anyway, right? Generally, yeah. people consider this to be one of the worst endings, it but is. it's worth pointing out that Team Cherry doesn't support any one ending as being the true ending. Each ending is canonical in its own right, and honestly, this ending isn't the worst. At least the Knight and Hornet will get to spend some quality time together. I don't think it's necessarily fair to be like, it's an irrelevant ending. It has relevance depending on how you play, and it does have relevance. I personally just do not like it compared to the other endings because it makes me sad. If the knight does dream of the Hollow Knight, it will be taken to an arena where it can finally fight the Radiance head on. But the knight isn't alone, as the other shades from the Abyss will appear in order to help corner the Radiance. Eventually the Radiance gets trapped in the tendrils of the Void. The knight bitch slaps her a couple times, and then the Radiance is consumed into the darkness. The Black Egg then appears to turn to shadows and the Void seeps down into the ground. Hornet awakens to find the knight's broken shell lying on the floor. We get one final shot of the shades in the abyss going to rest, and the game is over. This ending is called the Dream No More ending. The Radiance is gone, and Halloness is finally so free from her infection. This is such a good ending. Now I think it's fair to ask a few questions about how the Dream No More ending comes about. When the Hollow Knight was initially chosen to become the pure vessel, the abyss was sealed up and the rest of the vessels were left to rot away. But somehow, vessels ended up outside of the Abyss, and then one of those vessels was used to replace the Hollow Knight. Exactly how much of this operation was planned, if at all? The White Lady was waiting for a vessel. Did she have any communication with Hornet? Hornet was guarding the King's Brand, the only way for a vessel to enter the Abyss. How did she know it was necessary to guard the King's Brand from weaker vessels? But she's already Hell, killed one. If the vessels did escape the Abyss by themselves, wouldn't it be pointless to guard the King's Brand, since the vessels could just creep back into the Abyss the same way? I'm not going to provide any good answers to these questions, because God forbid I answer anything in this entire video. But I do want to point out that no plans to actually produce the Dream No More ending are explicitly stated in-game. So we can only speculate as to whether or not the White Lady or Hornet, or maybe even the Pale King, okay. knew that they could defeat the Radiance by creating a Lord of Shades like the Knight. Regardless, the next two endings were definitely not planned. In fact, the last two endings that were added in the Godmaster update almost feel this. out of place. But it's okay, the God Seekers basically hijack everything to the point where you don't even have to enter the Temple of the Black Egg to beat the game. That's like what? being Mario Bros without ever seeing Bowser. But on the other hand, the Godmaster endings basically reinforce that Hollow Nest does not exist in a vacuum, which can help the world of Hollow Knight feel more real. Because what else is reality but just a bunch of random chaotic stuff happening all the time? If the Knight finds the God Seeker in the junk pit, it will be able to enter her mind and refight all the bosses in the game. This is part of the God Seeker's ritual. They basically attune to the resonance of gods through ritual combat. This allows them to ascend their minds higher, and eventually, through the use of godly focus, achieve communication with the gods sleeping in Halloness' heart, the Radiance. Now I know what you're thinking. That's a pretty convoluted little religious practice they have going on here. What's next, are they gonna start measuring the Knight's Theon levels? It's pretty complicated, but the point is, these Godseekers have some serious capabilities to fuck things up in Halloness as we're about to see. As the knight makes it further and further through the four pantheons, the god seekers get closer and closer to making contact with the Radiance, locked away inside the Hollow Knight. At the end of the fourth pantheon, the Radiance makes herself aware in this strange reunion cutscene between the vessels. But she isn't the only one to make an appearance. The Void itself appears to go on the attack, rising up to meet the Radiance's call. It's at this point that the final challenge, the Pantheon of Hallownest, becomes available. The Godseeker finally acknowledges the knight as being more than just a simple cringer, 
and they begin to watch the night more intently. After defeating like a bazillion bosses in the final pantheon, the knight finally comes face to face with the Absolute Radiance, a stronger, more enhanced version of the game's final boss. Oh, finally, God. the stage is set. After roughly 40 minutes of intense agony and tedious boss battles, the knight has finally reached the ultimate enemy responsible for the destruction of Halonest. Truly, this will be a battle for the ages. But first, let's check in on our old pal Menerbug. As it turns out, he's still fine. alive when the knight arrives in Halonest, and he's still fulfilling his duty after all this time. Has Let's take children? one last look at his diary. My lovely diary. Someone's gone and broke. My favorite sign. Right there, Aww. at the top of the crossroads. Keeps happening, too. But you know, I just can't get mad about it. I should be thanking them, really. More chances to fix that beautiful, complex sign. And I've stocked up on spare parts, so... I have no fear it'll ever stay broken for long. Unfortunately, the only way to ever read the Menerbug's diary is to kill him in cold blood. I'm not <gasps> sure why Team Cherry thought this was necessary, but the general consensus on Reddit is that they are bloodthirsty warmongers, so it checks out. But at least Menerbug's last moments will be spent fixing one of his favorite signs in the Forgotten Crossroads. It's comforting to think that his final seconds of consciousness were spent oh, in total nice. bliss. Before we sent him hurtling into the infamous chasm that is Oblivion. No, that's awful. Well, anyways. The alternate fight between the Knight and the Radiance plays out differently than in the vanilla ending. This time around, the Knight is not accompanied by any shades. Instead, after defeating the Radiance, the Knight seems to transform into this monstrosity. Oh, geez. Now, this creature goes by many names the God of Gods, the Lord Shade, the Devourer, the Void Entity. But I don't really like any of those, so I will just call him Bill. Bill proceeds to completely annihilate the Radiance in spectacular fashion. We are then treated to the Embrace the Void ending. Bill comes back down from the sky, dropping into the rest of God home. The Godseeker starts to get pulled into Bill by Void Tendrils. We oh. then cut to the Godseeker in the junk God. pit. Void starts leaking out of her eyes, and it appears as though Bill is making an escape back into the real world which is probably a bad thing? Finally, yeah. we see Hornet standing outside of the Black Egg as the infection begins to disappear from nearby vines. Hornet hears footsteps coming from inside the Black Egg as the Hollow Knight reveals itself to her and the two prepare for combat. So from this cutscene, we can see that the Radiance's death in Godhome actually did kill her for real, meaning that the infection over Halonest is now gone. This means the seals inside of the Black Egg probably wore off, allowing the Hollow Knight to escape its prison. In other words, the Embrace of the Void ending is a goddamn cliffhanger, and we have no idea how Team Cherry plans to follow this up. Oh, the geez. Hollow Knight is running loose in Halonest, and the Knight has transformed into a raging void monster that might and try to destroy the entire kingdom, confronted. or at least what's left of it. What's even more strange about this ending is that the announced sequel, Hollow Knight Silk Song, doesn't seem to be related to this ending at all. But that's a whole is different it a sequel, show. Though? Obviously, could, the biggest mystery surrounding this know. ending is the appearance of Bill. Did this creature exist in the void already? Or was it somehow willed into existence by the power of the Godseekers? Did the knight turn into this thing, or did it just become a part of it? Examining a statue of this creature and other forms of the knight grant the player a Hunter's Journal entry for an ancient artifact called the Void Idol, which might imply this creature might have been worshipped by the ancient civilization. But again, that's pure speculation. We don't know what this worship of Void exactly looked like. Maybe the Void they worshipped took the form of something more sinister. There is one thing we know about this monster though. It's weak to flowers. Yes, these things. As it turns out, those delicate flowers that Zamir has stockpiled up her ass are actually useful for something. They contain a strange power that even deters the White Lady from touching one. The Godseeker, however, is dumb Aww. enough to accept a flower from the Knight. If you the player flower? does this, instead of Void being released out into the world, this flower pulls a no you, and the Godseeker and Void disappear into thin air. The flower itself is described as giving off a pale light, which appears to connect it to the pale beings. Like I said before, pale beings appear to be some form of top tier gods. As of right now, we are only aware of two, the Pale King and the White Lady. But the fact that Zamir brought these pale flowers from a faraway land implies that there are definitely more of them out there. 
Another small hint of the existence of pale beings are the pale ore items that can be found all over Hallownest. Did these come from the Pale King? Or possibly some other pale being? And what exactly are they? Are they poop? In general, the Godmaster endings appear to be doing a lot of setup for future Hollow Knight content. Like I said before, Hollow Knight Silksong doesn't seem to connect to these events on the surface, so we are in a bit of a bind when trying to discuss what these endings actually mean for the greater narrative Team Cherry's mm -hmm. building. There's definitely a lot more to consider about what the Pale Beings are and what properties they possess. And we also have plenty of questions surrounding the Void and how bugs have interacted with it in the past. It almost feels like we are looking through a keyhole, trying to grasp onto the totality of Team Cherry's creation. How powerful are creatures like Bill and the Worms? Where did things like the Void even come from to begin with? How much bigger is the world beyond Hallownest? Is Bardoon into butt stuff? But of course, that's the appeal of a game yes. like Hollow Knight. Having all of the answers to every question would just ruin the mystery of the world. Plus, if we didn't have questions like boring. this to waste our time on, then what else would we be doing with our lives? Go outside? Ew. Ugh. Touch grass? And so this video comes to an end. Now I know the average attention span of a YouTube viewer is 9 minutes, so let me leave you with a few takeaways. 1. Hollow Knight is a game about bugs. I know this may come as a shock, but it's true. Really? Watch the video again, and this time, huh. pay attention. You'll notice right away, I promise. 2. Murdering your own babies might not be such a good idea after all. I mean, this is obviously just my interpretation of the game's don't lore. Other people might children. have different views on the subject children, of murdering babies. And every children. opinion is valid, so I don't want to step on anyone's toes or anything. 3. Menderbug is fucking dead. 4. Nothing is certain. This video probably has a few flaws in it. Trying to construct a cohesive narrative with the information found in Hollow Knight isn't exactly straightforward. I'm sure my views will change in the future, and I encourage you to explore the lore yourself. 5. And this last point is fairly obvious, but I should mention it anyway. Cory in the House is the best anime. Oh, I have to admit this, his sense of humor, I, I love it. It's so funny. It's just so dry and sarcastic. And I kind of, I wish I could be that kind of sassy and dry and sarcastic. I, I really like the sense of humor. Um, Wow. Yeah. So that did clear up some things, but it did not obviously provide the answer for a lot of questions that I have. Um. From my understanding then essentially is Radiance is taking revenge on the king for uh, being forgotten and the light being cast aside because there's constantly, there's constant references to the light being cast away and the light being ignored, which I guess is Radiance who has been um, at the worship to her no longer exists. So um, Radiance did nothing wrong, okay? Radiance is innocent in all of this. It is the king's fault down with the monarchy this is a republic. Hallow Nest is now a republic. <laughs> Viva la revolution. But in all honesty, this is just making me want to replay the game and discover more of the lore for myself and take a bit more opportunity to read things. I know I read a lot of things while I was playing, but you're trying to connect stuff and it could be quite difficult. So this is making me want to go back and play it all over again. So I have a beg bigger bit bigger and better understanding of the game and its narrative and i think that's exactly what i'm going to do after this video is jump into a fresh playthrough and take my time to explore and find absolutely everything that i can find but I'm so excited that I finally watched this. Thank you very much for watching my reaction video. I have never done a reaction video, so I don't know if I did it correctly or not. I know I kept pausing it because I had opinions to give, but um, it would have felt weird just to kind of sit here and be quiet and not kind of give my take on things. But if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. And we'll be starting our Hollow Knight Pantheon runs on YouTube streams 
as of the 7th of January at 3 p.m. GMT. And what that is, is essentially I will be streaming on YouTube. Um, for those that have asked, the videos will stay up. They will be available to watch if you can't make the streams. I would never take them down. I would never um, hide them behind a paywall. They will be available for everybody to watch. They will be on the Hollow Knight playlist, so they will get added to the entire playlist so if you ever want an easy way to find it other than looking on my channel and going on to streams and being like oh there it is it will be on the playlist i understand that not everybody will be able to make streams and that some people do want to see this content so yeah the videos will be up they will be quite a bit longer and then a regular episode because obviously the pantheons can take a while and when i'm live streaming live streaming can be anywhere between three and four hours for me um, but I felt like it would be a nice kind of break. I can free myself up to do some other additional Let's Plays, but also challenge running is hard. I have done challenge runs of Dark Souls, Bloodborne and Elden Ring and just being able to talk and interact with people is such a, a, a mood lifter because challenge runs are brutal, they can be draining, they can be exhausting. So having the interaction and the company while you're doing something that is <laughs> mentally draining because of how difficult it can be is definitely a plus so i'm looking forward to doing these streams and i hope to see some of you all there and we will also be beginning blasphemous in the new year which i'm really excited about but everyone seems to be really excited about blasphemous so we'll be doing our first blind playthrough of that so if that's something you are looking forward to seeing please make sure to hit the bell notification to be made aware of every time i post anything on this channel and until next time Bye.